everyone. We had, uh, we were very impressed with the engagement that all of you brought to the presentations uh, this morning. Lots of good questions. And uh, hopefully uh, what we're going to be able to do here this afternoon is provide you a little bit more detailed answers, a little deeper dive on some of the questions that you asked, show you some data, help you connect the dots. Uh, so that's uh, what we're going to try to do here today. So a lot of you asked the question, how much nitrogen will I lose in scenario X, right? And that is a very difficult question to answer because in classic agronomy terms, it depends, right? It depends on a lot of different factors. But one question that's a little bit easier for me to answer is how much nitrogen can you lose? Because we have been monitoring uh, nitrogen loss from different sources over many, many years. And we know what worst case scenarios look like. And we can tell you with some level of, of certainty uh, how much nitrogen you could potentially lose if conditions turn against you. And that's really, I think, how you need to think about nitrogen management. It is a risk management philosophy. I, I think about it almost the same way I think about managing grain price risk. Right? There are a whole bunch of different tools that I can pull off the shelf to make sure that I protect myself against downside risk of, of crop prices moving against me, right? I can use futures, I can use options, I can store grain on the farm, I can hedge to arrive, uh, forward contract, all kinds of different tools depending upon what fits my operation, what fits my needs at the time, what fits the market dynamics. And what I'm really trying to do with those tools is protect myself against a catastrophic loss where crop prices move into the into the red and I would be unprofitable. And that is exactly what we're doing with nitrogen management is we're trying to apply technology tools so that we protect ourselves against that catastrophic nitrogen loss scenario that erodes yield, hurt, hurts revenues and puts you in a, at risk of being unprofitable in your core production. So uh, we, we, we try to adopt a okay yeah can you help me advance the slide there we go thank you guys and so if you look here at uh, Fred Velo uh, at University of Illinois his seven wonders of the corn world what what you see here is that Nitrogen is the second largest factor on the list in terms of yield determination. It, it, it holds about 26% of the impact to yield uh, performance in corn. And the really disturbing part of this chart is that the big, even bigger factor is a factor that is completely out of your control. It is not, it is not a decision factor. It is, it is a, a factor that you have no control over, and that is the weather. And even worse news now, the fate of your nitrogen is totally dependent on factor number one. So when, when you're facing that kind of uncertainty and you're facing a factor that has a huge influence on your yield and your nitrogen uh, that you have no control over, you've got to take control of what you can. And that's why uh, inhibitor technologies are such a powerful tool. So, Part of what makes nitrogen management so difficult is that the weather is unpredictable, right? It's uncertain. We don't know what the future is going to bring. And as a farmer, I can tell you, I am subject to recency bias. I tend, my decisions tend to be influenced more by what happened last year than what happened over a long period of time. And that could be a sand trap. That's a, that's a decision trap. Uh, because if you look at uh, here, April through August, 2022, in Ontario, uh, cumulative, this is precipitation variance from normal, right? And you look at the same period in 2023, you can see pretty striking differences in rainfall, uh, you know, um, percentage from normal. Last year was a little bit drier on the whole in that period of time. This year, a little bit wetter, especially as we got later in the season. And because we can't predict that uh, pattern uh, of weather, we've got to take matters into our own hands and take what we can control uh, to manage our risk. So we had a lot of questions uh, this morning about different nitrogen forms and how they behave in the soil. And this little diagram right here is really designed to kind of help you get your arms around that. Uh, there are two major plant available forms of nitrogen uh, that we deal with. First is ammonium nitrate that is positively charged 
ammonium cations that you see over here on the left. And the second uh, major form of, of nitrogen for plant uptake is nitrate N, negatively charged NO3 over here on the right. And a lot of times I think we get into this mindset that, well, nitrate is bad because it leaches or I can lose nitrates. But in reality, both forms of nitrogen kind of have their pros and their cons. And one form is not necessarily better than, than the other. The, the big pro with ammonium nitrogen, the positively charged, is it sticks to the soil cation exchange capacity. And so uh, from that standpoint, it's very stable. It, it, it's not prone to loss from the environment. And so it stays put. But the downside of ammonium in is that it's not very mobile. And so we, the plant roots have a hard time getting to it. It doesn't flow with water in the soil. Uh, and the plants uh, have to go out and find it, uh, grow roots out to it. So if you've got ammonium in and it's not in close proximity to the plant, the plant's not going to see it. The flip side of the coin is nitrate. Uh, it is you know, considered bad because it's negatively charged, therefore it doesn't stick to the cation exchange, stays in solution, and it, and it is prone to leaching and denitrification losses. So it is a form that's prone to loss. But the positive benefit of nitrate is that it is highly mobile and it will move with mass flow uh, in soil water to the root system. So it will flow to the plant. And so uh, because of that, about 80% of total nitrogen uptake by corn is actually in the nitrate form. So nitrate is not bad inherently. It's, it's good because you can drive a lot of uptake uh, into the plant. But what we've got to do is we've got to control the timing of the conversion of ammonium to nitrate so that we're optimizing nitrogen availability to the plant at all times. That's the key. So uh, I always like to say we should start with the end in mind, right? What is our goal as we're looking at nitrogen management? Uh, this is a classic uh, nitrogen uptake curve for corn. Uh, it shows pounds of uptake on the vertical axis as a function of maturity along the bottom from planting all the way to R6, and the colors under the curve represent the different plant parts. So we have green as tissue, uh, blue as green, and so on, right? And so if you look at this chart, you can really subdivide this chart into three distinct zones. Uh, the first zone is early growth, uh, say from planting or even pre-planting up till about V6, V7. And what you see there is not much activity on uptake, right? The plant isn't taking up a lot of nitrogen. So if you're putting down pre-plant in or at plant in, it is more vulnerable to loss in this window because the plant's just not using it. Uh, so the name of the game early is protect your end. Keep it from being lost. Then the plant switches from the, uh, the early root, uh, no, uh, seminal root system to the nodal root system, right? So the plant moves into overdrive, big, big nutrient uptake, rapid vegetative growth. And you see the sharp uptick in, in uptake. And that's the period of time when availability is important. You need to meet plant demand during that window of time. So you want controlled conversion of ammonium to nitrate in that window so that the nitrate is mobile and it can get into the plant and drive this uh, uptake curve. Then we get to reproductive growth. And I think a lot of us think, oh, we're in cruise control at that point, right? We, we made it. Uh, we made it through the season. We tassel, got good pollination out, just need to fill grain. Don't really need to worry about nitrogen very much at that point. But if you look at this curve, it continues to climb the hill all the way to R6 black layer maturity. The, the, and the curve, the blue curve, looks like a wedge, right? It looks like a piece of pie. Well, that's because the plant is able to remobilize some of the nitrogen from the plant tissue up into the grain. But the fact that that curve keeps climbing tells you that the plant has to continue to absorb nitrogen from the external environment as well. And so if you get to that point in the growing season and you run out of nitrogen in the vault and, it's, and your vault is empty, uh, you're not going to optimize yield during that grain fill period. So it doesn't matter how much rain you get in August, how cool the nights are, uh, when you're trying to fill the grain, you will not capitalize on those things if there's not uh, some residual fertilizer nitrogen in the system to get it into the plant uh, to make that happen. So you want to make sure you're finishing strong. 
I'm going, I guess we'll swap spots here. Uh, so start talking about a little bit, where is that nitrogen going? We touched on that this morning a little bit about some of the processes, but we'll go into a little bit more details on that. So really when we talk about nitrogen loss, and you probably heard about this a little this morning, this hopefully visualizes it a little bit for you as well, is there is really three ways that nitrogen is gonna be lost. So as we learned this morning, volatilization is the most important, but there's also leaching and denitrification. Closer. I think I'm close. I feel like I need to start uh, singing a song or something like that, but uh, I will put you through that. All right, next slide, please. Yeah, well, we'll talk about volatilization. So volatilization, so we touched on that. Oh, we can go to the next one. Uh, so how does volatilization happen? So this hopefully will kind of put a little bit into visual what we talked about this morning when you stopped by the, the station there. So basically you put urea, so whether it's 4600 urea down or the urea from your UAN is on the ground there. Uh, and you get a little bit of water. You don't need much, just a little bit. And it's a little enzyme called the urease enzyme. So you can see that below the plus sign. So that enzyme is actually everywhere. It's on the residue, it's on the soil, it's, it's there. So you really have a, that component of this whole reaction is gonna be there. You just need to add the urea and have a little bit of water and the whole process starts. I mentioned this morning it was an enzymatic process. It's not driven by bacteria, it's just driven by this enzyme that is uh, present in the soil. And that's gonna start that conversion right away over to carbon dioxide and ammonia, which is good. We want that process because as Tim showed, your plant can't take up urea. It can only take up a little bit of the ammonium and the nitrates. So we want it to get there. It's just making sure that we put that, you know, that reaction happen on your time rather than nature's time. So what are some of those factors that drive? All right, so we're not fixed, so we can kind of flip through this as well. Uh, so what are some of those factors that drive it? So there's, an, basically it's gonna be happening uh, at any point during uh, that, when that urea gets put down, but there's some things that we know are gonna drive that a little bit faster. So soil moisture, so again, need water for that hydrolysis process to happen, so it makes sense, you gotta need some moisture. So you get that little bit of moisture, and we talked about this morning, you get that tenth, two tenths of rain, that's kind of your worst case scenario for any urea that's on the soil surface, because that's gonna not be enough to push it down, uh, and it's gonna be enough to start that hydrolysis and start getting that conversion happening. Um, so obviously, once we get to real high moisture levels, that's gonna help push that urea down, so we get too high of moisture, that's gonna help actually reduce some of your volatilization uh, so it's just that little bit. Uh, high soil pH, uh, so again, the higher your soil pH is, yeah, that's also going to drive that uh, volatilization faster. Uh, warm temperatures, so uh, I think that question came up this morning as well, but yeah, as those temperatures start to increase, uh, that's going to drive that. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen when it's cold. Even near freezing soils, you can still have this process happening. So even below that typical microbial um, activity of 8, 10 degrees Celsius, even if you get down 2, 3 degrees Celsius, this process will happen, just slower, but the faster it happens, the warmer it gets. Uh, low cation exchange capacity. Now, so this is your lighter soil, your sandy soils, low organic matter soils. So as uh, Tim showed that slide there where you have the ammonium is being positively charged, that'll stick to the soil. So the higher uh, it's got exchange capacity you have, so that just means the more clay or higher soil organic matter, that's gonna help stick it. Uh, any of those soils that have less of that, that makes that ammonium that is more free and able to be converted quickly over to, to nitrate and that process happening as well. And then high crop residues. So again, mentioned that enzyme is on plant tissues as well as the soil. So if you think about that urea being stuck on a plant tissue, uh, maybe it's on your residue in your field, uh, it can't get down to the soil, can't get down into it, so it's gonna be sit there, that's gonna be potentially lost to volatilization as well. Um, and again, this is, just highlights how much rain. So we talked about that high moisture. How much moisture do you need? So this is that graph I think Tim mentioned a couple of times on there uh, in terms of how much do we need. Uh, so this really was showing at the bottom there, this is an irrigated trial. Um, so the amount of rain in inches, so 0.2.4 inches, uh, that's how much uh, water is applied. And then the nitrogen loss is going up uh, on the side axis there. And you can see there, as you increase your water, that's going to start re uh, pushing that nitrogen farther down into the soil. But the key thing here is we have to get over into this point here, it, just over 0.4 on that, uh, on that uh, line to really start driving that nitrogen down far enough into the soil uh, to really make sure that it's not going to be lost. So that's where we use that half an inch. So if you get a half an inch of rainfall, that's what you need to get that nitrogen pushed down, where it's going to be safe, uh, and your crop's going to be able to use it. You get less than that, it's not pushing it far enough down, 
wrong and it can be lost. Uh, another piece to you know trying to manage through because there are some other ways that you know, as we try to manage through your nitrogen is that incorporation. We touched on this uh, on the demonstration as well, and this is just highlighting some of those same same things that we saw here uh, at the demonstration as well, where the uh, the uh, nitrogen nitrogen UAN actually had more volatilization losses than the surface applied. And this is showing a similar thing as well, where just because you're incorporating it, if you're not getting it down to that three inches, you're just getting a slight incorporation, you're actually driving up that volatilization losses more. So just because you put in the soil, doesn't mean that it's gonna stay in the soil. It's something to really kind of keep in mind, and you know, it's kind of counterintuitive, because we want to have it in the soil, but if it's not it's not deep enough, it's just shallow, you put it in moisture, you're mixing in with the soil, that can really drive that nitrogen loss. So uh, getting it down deep is good, um, but obviously if you can start to utilize uh, different products like an enhanced efficiency fertilizer, that can help manage it uh, as well and reduce some of those losses that you see. So how do we how do we manage through that? So as we talked a little bit this morning, using the right source, that's using an enhanced efficiency product at the right timing to make sure that you're using the, 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 the product to help keep your nitrogen where you want it and not lose it to the atmosphere. Um, this is again just showing some of the different products that you can utilize um, as a way to help manage it against untreated urea. This is urea, but it just shows some of the difference. And we had some questions on how fast does this happen? Um, so this just shows, it's a nice demonstration of showing that time at the bottom um, and then how much ammonia is lost going up the side. And we have that rapid loss. Hopefully I don't make it squeak again here. Right at the start there where it's going up and you can start to see how quickly that happens and then it tapers off. And the question is, is, is how does that help when you start using an enhanced efficiency product? Well, you can see, and Tim did a good job of mentioning how it kind of flattens that line out earlier. The, the, your losses at some point is gonna, it's gonna flatten out. You're gonna stop reducing, or you're gonna reduce uh, the amount of losses you're gonna see over time because most of it's already volatilized out. So when you start using a product uh, to help manage that, you're kind of capping that. You're kind of limiting the total amount of nitrogen loss. Um, so you still see a similar curve. It's just much smaller and much uh, more controlled. So that's really what I wanted to take as a take home message there to help kind of visualize where that loss is happening, why it happens fast and then it tapers off. So it's not really about how much time you're trying to buy, it's how much, uh, how much of that loss you're trying to cap by using an enhanced efficiency product. And then the, this last one here is just showing how that can help in different residue uh, uh, fields as well. So this here is looking at two different fields with different residues. So there's a low residue on the left and high residue in the, on the right. And just showing again, different nitrogen rates of untreated versus uh, treated with anvil. Uh, oh, sorry, this is Angra Jane uh, with this one. Um, and just showing how that can help cap it uh, as well. So you see very similar curves on the low residue versus high residue, but as I mentioned earlier, higher the residue, the more loss, and this really kind of helps demonstrate that. You see those higher loss numbers in a high residue application, um, but by using that enhanced efficiency product, in this case, Agritain, helps kind of keep those levels down and it kind of negates some of those issues. So again, as we I talked about a little before, about how there are some things that can drive the loss, you can't really control the fields you have. You can't control your soil pH, you can't control your moisture. Um, there's a little bit of residue, but that's hard to manage as well um, by using a product to help uh, negate some of those problems that you might run into and help keep more of that nitrogen there. It's a way to equalize between your fields a bit. Uh, and the last one I just to touch on because we spend a lot of time talking about ammonia volatilization, but we want to talk about a little bit about the other forms of loss. So that's leaching and denitrification. So where do we see these? So what is leaching? Leaching is when you lose that nitrate, so that final form, and you lose it through the soil. As Tim showed, it, uh, it moves with water because it is a negatively charged, so it moves. So if you get those high moisture rainfalls in your coarse soils, it can push it down farther into the soil profile. If you've got tiling and you're pulling water through, uh, through those tiles, it can pull it through there as well. Thinking about uh, nitrate is wherever your water is going, that nitrate can be going too. That's what the plant uses to take it up. So it's the, the way the field can lose it as well. So where are some of these risk areas? So obviously those coarse textured sandy soils are always gonna be a little bit more risk for uh, leaching. And then you need rain, you need moisture. 
to come in. So that's where those, uh, uh, those big rains coming down. So when you get those big four inch rains that happen and all that water is going to start moving down through your soil profile, moving into your tiles and flowing out, that's going to be taking some of that nitrate with it. And how much can you lose? You can lose quite a bit with this uh, because it, there's nothing in the field to hold it there. Um, it is going to be one of those situations where uh, if it's nitrate and you have a lot of water moving through your field, it's going to take it with it. The other side of it is the denitrification one. Uh, and this is the one that we hear a little bit more about because this is where uh, nitrous oxide fits into it. Uh, and, and some of those uh, conversations that have happened around nitrous oxide, it happens through the denitrification process. And that's really gonna happen when your soils get saturated. So probably the easiest way for, that I tend to think of it is you've got your nitrate, it's a nitrogen, it's got three oxygen stuck on it. Um, saturated soils, there's no oxygen in there, the bacteria in the soil, they need the oxygen, they're going to start pulling them off, pop, 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 as they go, as they pull those off, that's changing it, right, you're going to get nitrous oxide, you're going to get um, N2 gas as well as another form of loss in denitrification, and that's going to take those oxygens, and once it starts moving, you start taking those oxygens off, that's going to start allowing that gas to start moving up through the soil profile, and then be lost. Um, where it gets concerned is from that environmental standpoint with nitric oxide, but really from the standpoint of on your farms, you don't see much of a loss from this. It's not as substantial as what we see with uh, ammonia volatilization or even leaching from a straight nitrogen loss. It's more of a concern about what it's doing once it's out there. What are some of the, the risk factors with denitrification? So that's gonna be those saturated soils. Um, so anytime you get super wet soils, that's where it's gonna happen. And that's when you can, uh, you can uh, go out and test for those. Uh, there's a different kind of equipment you can use in the field. Uh, they're very expensive. A lot of the researchers are, are playing around with these different tools now. But anytime they get a rainfall on the field, a big rain, they always say they see those that nitrous oxide numbers really start to pop up. Uh, so that's going to be the biggest effect. Uh, those finely textured soils, so those clay soils, because that water doesn't move in as fast, it sits there at the surface. Uh, again, that's going to be some of those soils that you see. And then uh, temperature. So this one is driven by microbes, so bacteria in the soil. Uh, so the warmer temperature, the, f the faster they're going to be able to move through. All right, so we had a lot of questions, and, and the demo this morning is really focused on UAN. Uh, because we oftentimes uh, run, run into people who think that uh, because they're using liquid nitrogen, it's not prone to loss. And uh, it just simply isn't true. Hopefully the demo uh, today kind of showed you uh, the potential uh, loss in UAN. And the reason, this thing doesn't like me, uh, the reason that we have loss risk in UAN is due to the composition of liquid nitrogen. So it's UAN, urea ammonium nitrate. And if we look at the composition, about 50% of the nitrogen uh, in UAN is sourced from urea. And so that urea is just like white urea in terms of it being prone to volatilization loss. It has to break down, it has to hydrolyze, and you can lose ammonia in that process. The other 25% as ammonium in, we've got colored as kind of a medium risk there because when that urea hydrolyzes, it changes the pH in that zone and can drive off the ammonium nitrogen as well. So about 75% of the nitrogen in UAN is subject to volatilization loss. Uh, the nitrate in colored gray here, no risk of it volatilizing, uh, but the risk for it is different. Uh, the risk for it is on this side of the chart. So if we talk about the low ground loss, that nitrate in is colored dark red and is your highest risk because there's nothing you can do to protect it. As soon as you put it out there, it's prone to loss, uh, like Bryce was describing. So you got 25% that you can't even protect. Uh, but then you've got 25% as ammonium. That's going to convert to nitrate over time in the soil. Uh, that takes about one to two weeks when soil temps get warm. So it's going to be trailing right behind nitrate. It's going to be converting to nitrate. And then you've got the urea. It's got to break down to ammonium in. That takes about a week. And then it goes through the nitrification process as well. So 100% of this nitrogen is going to turn into nitrate most likely uh, before uh, it is absorbed by the plant, which means that all of it's at risk for below ground loss. So UAN uh, is definitely uh, at risk for loss, both above and below ground. And just to demonstrate, uh, you know, uh, you saw some volatilization loss curves that Bryce showed you for urea. Uh, this is just a comparison uh, of uh, UAN uh, that we did with University of Tennessee 
uh, back in 2021, so a couple years ago now. And you see that over a period of time, and again, the first three to five days, you get that really sharp uptick, right? We see the most loss early, and it caps out at around 24% total losses with UAN. And that's a very typical number uh, that we would see uh, with UAN. With Anvil, we reduce those losses down to about 8% in the same time frame. And so what that translates to uh, is a 50 pound total loss on that 210 pound application with untreated, with Anvil we're saving 31 of those 50 pounds, right? So we're losing a lot less if we stabilize that UAN. And that translates straight through to yield. Uh, if you look at, this is the corresponding yield chart uh, for that volatilization graph. And what we see, especially if you focus on kind of that middle 180 pound uh, per acre application, uh, we see a very substantial 32 bushel yield response at the 180 pound application rate. Uh, that 31 pounds uh, was turned to grain, corn grain yield, almost on a pound per uh, bushel basis. We also see uh, something that um, is pretty common uh, in all of our research trials that I've been involved with since I came to Coke and even historically, and I call it the stair-step efficiency uh, uh, chart. And so what you see is that uh, Anvil treated urea or UAN at 180 actually performed better than and statistically the same as 240 untreated. So somebody said, well, can I reduce my nitrogen rate? Uh, if you're using 240 pounds, probably, right? Uh, in this particular scenario, you could go with uh, 180, which would probably be a more like a recommended rate in Tennessee, stabilize it and still get better performance than if you put an additional 60 pounds on. And uh, 60 pounds of nitrogen is gonna pay for a lot of stabilizer, I can assure you of that. And we see the same thing if we go further down the hill, right? 120 pounds stabilized performed identically to 180 unstabilized. Uh, we would probably, you know, suggest some caution uh, with going that low, right? You could potentially put yourself at risk for yield loss by being too low. The mantra that we use, and we, you know, we kind of emphasize this with one of the groups that came through, is use the right rate stabilized. Don't put insurance nitrogen on because that nitrogen could be lost to the environment. Uh, and that really, uh, you know, is tough to explain as an industry why we would be doing a practice like that, right? If we have a stewardship obligation to make sure we don't, uh, you know, we don't send our nutrients uh, out of the system and off into our waters. This thing really does not like me. There we go. So we're going to kind of hopefully pull this all together uh, with this chart here, which is uh, unmanaged risk means missed opportunity. And how much missed opportunity are we talking about? So. Over here on this side, you see this chart, and, and the bar kind of projects downward uh, because it represents loss. This is nitrogen going away, right? The blue represents a very sort of common, typical, low-risk kind of year where, you, let's say, you only lose 15% uh, of your total nitrogen to above and below ground loss. Uh, that's about 9 pounds of the, of the 60 pounds in this example. If you get into a more typical... Um, you know, loss scenario around 30%, like some of the charts we were showing you, that translates to 18 pounds. If you're in a very high risk scenario, you lose a lot of N. Now we're talking about 27 pounds of nitrogen loss. And if we just use a very simple corn grain removal rate, very conservative, 0.8 pounds of nitrogen per bushel of corn grain, what, what we see, if this works, you may have to advance it, Bryce. Let's see if we can pull that. No, we just have a. Oh, it's telling us it needs to reboot. So that's always the oh, way it works. Yeah, but that's that's just to remind me. <laughs> there we go. Give it a whirl now, Tim. Okay. There we go. So on the top side of the chart now is the yield uh, corresponding yield response or yield opportunity that you've given up. So even in a low risk year, you give up seven bushel of yield potential in a low risk situation. That will easily pay for the cost of the stabilizer. Uh, in a more typical scenario, 14 bushel, and then uh, the, the really uh, bad uh, case, you, you gain a 21 bushel uh, response for that 27 pounds of nitrogen that you lose. All of these uh, scenarios are 
highly positive ROI for stabilization. And so I'm gonna let uh, Bryce, our, our, our in-house nitrous oxide expert, uh, talk to you about uh, the climate impacts of nitrogen management. All right, so I figured it'd be a good opportunity just to kind of talk a little bit about nitrous oxide because that's a very hot topic right now. All right, everyone's been sitting there, you had a big meal and everything else. Let's kind of like loosen up a little bit here. How many people have heard of nitrous oxide? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, that's good. I was worried if no one did, I was going to ask if people knew what a greenhouse gas was. So, all right, we're one step ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, nitrous oxide is obviously uh, something that's been talked a lot about here in Canada. Um, there, there's other jurisdictions, but Canada has definitely been one of the ones leading the charge in terms of discussing nitrous oxide. So, it's probably good to just have a conversation about nitrous oxide, what it is, um, and how it affects your farm. Uh, so, nitrous oxide, I think if I go to the next one here. Is, uh, is a greenhouse gas that uh, many governments and the Canadian government is, is very concerned uh, about uh, from an environmental standpoint. But from an economic standpoint, you really don't notice it much on your farms. So typically, uh, about 1% of your nitrogen in Canada, and that's even being a little generous from a lot of studies, of your nitrogen is going to be lost as nitrous oxide. So that's the kind of thing. So we have to make sure we break two things apart right now. Um, I'm not going to ask you with a show of hands or anything, but I'm pretty sure that many of you with losing 1% of your nitrogen that you put down is probably not keeping you awake at night. Does anyone want to disagree with me on that one? So, uh, so kind of thing. So from a, from a farm economic standpoint, Nitrous oxide has not been a big concern. I remember learning about it in university and I hadn't really thought about it much since then until all this came out. Uh, but the government is concerned about it from the standpoint of their concern over uh, how it affects uh, climate change and everything. And we're not gonna have a discussion on people's opinions on that. It's just that we we'll state the fact that the government is concerned about it from the farm point you're not. So we should really kind of understand where that's going and why some of the things they're doing. So. Um, Remember what's going on here? Why does it matter uh, just because of the uh, carbon equivalent? It, it is from an atmospheric standpoint, and there is science that I show that, that it does have more of a greenhouse gas effect than straight carbon dioxide. And stabilizers are a good way to help reduce that. So how many people have heard of the OFCAP program, On Farm Climate Action Fund? And so, uh, so I'm sure many of you have at least heard it in passing if you're not completely familiar with it. Um, and what that is, is the government uh, does realize that from a farm standpoint, you're probably not as concerned about it because there's not a lot of economic driven demand to manage your nitrous oxide, whereas they, they're concerned about it. So that's where this funding has come with their focus in terms of uh, trying to get uh, farmers to adopt different practices uh, to help uh, mitigate nitrous oxide effect. So one of the things we want to talk about is just a little bit on how uh, these the enhanced efficiency products can help from a standpoint of nitrous oxide and they are one of the BMPs that do fit across all of the, the different organizations that are implementing the off-cap funding. Um, and so they all have a different uh, a factor and efficacy in terms of it, in terms of from ammonia, urea, and UAN. So let's dive a little bit more into um, when, when it happens and then what kind of how the different products can help. So when does the nitrous oxide happen in your field? So it's going to happen in two different points. So one of them, and it's the smaller one, I walked the wrong way again. Uh, the, uh, the, the smaller one is during that conversion. So when you've got ammonia, and it's going to start moving over to nitrate. So that nitrification process that just happens in the field, there's going to be a little bit of nitrous oxide, a little bit of nitrogen gas, N2 gas, will get emitted out of the soil. Uh, that's just happened, but that's the, the kind of the small amount of nitrous oxide. The one that is a, a, a bigger concern and where a lot of the focus has been on is on the denitrification process. And that happens, if you remember that slide, let's see if anyone's paying attention. I want to throw it an answer. When does denitrification happen? I know it's a big group, people don't want to usually say anything out loud. So I'll pretend that someone said, yes, that is correct, saturated soil. Thank you for saying that. Um, so it does happen under saturated soil conditions. So big rains, snow melts, etc. There's always a spike. So every spring, 
you know, if there's nitrate in your soil, and there's probably going to be some nitrate. I'm sure you've done the uh, soil testing and everything else, and you'll have so many pounds of nitrate in your soil. You know, hopefully you're probably, you know, probably targeting, you know, 10, 15 pounds of uh, nitrate in your soil. Some years, if they're dry years, it's higher. Wet years, it can be lower uh, kind of thing. So even if you have background nitrate in your soil, you've done nothing else, that snow melts in the spring, Oh, you're going to get some nitrous oxide that is measurable if you have the equipment out there. So there's always going to be a certain amount of background nitrous oxide that's coming out of the land. That's just a given. Um, but the other piece to it is after you do your nitrogen application, so what other form you're using, you're using urea and it's converted over to nitrate, you're using et cetera, et cetera, uh, that it starts to get to that point and it's sitting as nitrate and you get a big rain. So that's the other spot where it happens. So especially early in the season, if you put all your nitrogen up front, uh, and then you get that big rain, saturates your soil. That's where they start to see really big spikes on nitrous oxide uh, from there. Again, it's still gonna be in that less than 1% of your nitrogen down, so to keep that in perspective. But from the, uh, the environmental side, that's where they see the big spikes happening. And that's where they wanna try driving a lot of those changes. So that's where uh, the enhanced efficiency fertilizers fit into the, into the program as a best management practice. So hopefully that kind of sets the stage as to why they're in and how it's being uh, utilized. So in terms of that, uh, the big ones are it's the nitrification inhibitor, which is no surprise because it happens during nitrification, denitrification, and nitrification inhibitor. If you keep things with your nitrogen from being a nitrate for a little while, that's going to really help reduce the amount of nitrous oxide. So that's the biggest driven one. Uh, the dual inhibitor is the other one that, uh, and that's the one gets talked about mostly from the, from the program. And that's really just surrounding the idea that you kind of have the best of both worlds, where you're going to help reduce that volatilization losses that we spend a lot of time today talking about, but can also help reduce the denitrification. But even a straight urease inhibitor does help reduce it. Um, not nearly as much uh, as the other ones, um, but it does help reduce it. So really, you know, no matter which uh, uh, enhanced efficiency product you're utilizing, um, and I don't have polymer coated up here too, but polymer coated does have a reduction on as well, similar about to the urease inhibitor. They're about the, the same in terms of their, their difference in, uh, in reducing nitrous oxide. They do have an effect on that, so that's kind of the reason uh, why you're starting to see these products being talked a little bit more from a nitrous oxide. And obviously because of the nitrification piece, it's really driven to the nitrification inhibitor and the dual inhibitor. So like a product like Tribune fits in it or Centurio has a straight nitrification inhibitor. Those are the ones that are gonna really provide those benefits. So, so Bryce, would it be fair to say that regardless of how you feel about climate change, right now the government is going to incentivize you to use inhibitors? That is correct. So that, and that's the, the background as to why. All right, and the last one, I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Yeah, I can just stay over here. Uh, so we talked a lot about this out, out in the field, right? Right stabilizer for the job. You gotta pick the right tool to manage the risk that you have in your 4R nitrogen management system. And so if we uh, take a look at what, you know, what does that look like when we're, when we're applying nitrogen to the surface or shallow incorporating, especially when it's warm and we got high residue, urease inhibitor is the choice of the day. If we're injecting or incorporating and we're going early in the growing season when we really are more prone to uh, losses uh, and soils that might be either sandy or tightly textured and stay wet, either one of those two, then we want a nitrification inhibitor. And if you've got a combination of those factors, that's when you would consider using a dual uh, inhibitor type of, of approach. Uh, so. Uh, bottom line for us here is this, uh, nitrogen loss is real, uh, it happens with both urea and UAN, uh, it uh, can have a, a very important negative impact to your bottom line if you don't manage the risk, and the good news is, I mean, we've got some very good, very effective tools uh, to work on that and help you with that. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah, we had this question earlier as well, and there are a lot of different approaches you can take, but generally speaking, I think where we landed on this one was if you do a split nitrogen application program in wheat, so the, the, the question was which one for wheat. I would probably consider a dual inhibitor on the first application because that nitrogen is gonna be in the environment longer and more prone to loss. And on the second one, as the season warms up a little bit, 
Uh, you've got more chance of volatilization risk, and so I would probably use Anvil uh, in that case. Uh, on my own farm this past year, I used Anvil in both applications. Uh, we, we aren't uh, blessed to have Tribune available uh, to us in the U.S. market. That is a Canada-only product, and so uh, Anvil was the best choice for me and, and uh, worked out very well. We had very nice, uh, you know, very nice wheat yields this past year.